to the Scream Queer Podcast with Ralph Anthony. The following content contains topics describing graphic violence, strong sexual content, explicit language, and elements that may not be suitable for some audiences. Listener discretion is advised. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back into the podcast. We have a big episode with a lot to cover, so I'm going to just go ahead and jump right in. First and foremost, the wait is over. Scream 6 has slashed its way into cinemas everywhere, and I cannot tell you how fucking stoked I am. But before I give you my full review, I want to warn you that there will be spoilers. So if you're somebody who does not like spoilers and you are planning on checking out the film, stop listening, go watch it, then come back later and we'll talk then. I first want to talk about Scream 6 The Experience, which was a little pop-up shop that was open for... Uh, about two weeks in Santa Monica, California. Uh, can I just add this this movie's budget for promo and all that stuff was insane. They really pulled out all the stops for this movie from the Hello Ghostface website where Ghostface can call you or if you're a little troll like myself, you enter in your friend's number and their name and then have Ghostface call them and kind of freaked them out a little bit their social media presence and promo it was crazy just just all of it like paramount or whoever was behind their whole promo was just they were just going in so the studio created this experience they transformed it into new york city in the world of scream six so once you enter you're in a replica or like a set that is very similar to the bodega seen in scream six uh for those of you who haven't seen it it's when you it's at the very beginning of the trailer when jenna ortega and uh melissa barrera um are running asking for help Um, So this place was decked out in Easter eggs for the fans. Uh, Let me tell you, there were snacks named after characters from the franchise. There were stabbed chocolates uh, and just a whole bunch of cool Woodsboro postcards and like little nods to the franchise. Uh, Not to forget all of Gail's books, including Sydney's book, Out of Darkness. They were on the shelves next to the bodega employee it was just so fucking cool and i wanted to pick up a book so bad and just search through it and can i just say i don't know if it's how i was raised maybe i was raised to not touch things that aren't mine or like whenever i would go into a store uh, and there was like glass around like my dad would be very like stern with me and be like do not touch anything so going into this experience i kind of figured like we weren't going to be able to really touch any of the like props and whatnot so i didn't touch anything but tell me why tell me why not even a full minute with them being there the employees are yelling please do not touch anything i'm just like god people like this is why we can't have nice things like just don't touch anything just like look look and take pictures like you don't have to touch things like i get it we're excited we want to be a part of the movie somehow we want content but just like going into this like you know firsthand that you can't touch anything i went on the very last day of the whole thing I wish I would have gone day one because uh, Mason Gooding was there and that would have been fucking awesome to go through that with him. Yeah, so they just had us walking around this bodega for about three minutes, which was three minutes too long because I 
soaked in everything that I possibly could within one minute. Um, so then once your time is up there, then the lights start flickering and it feels kind of spooky. And then the bodega employee screams, hey, you got a call. And then we all proceed to the next room. I felt this went a little bit too long for my liking, but there are two screens on both sides of you. Uh, and then it like goes dark and then you hear the phone ring and Ghostface starts talking to you. It's probably my least favorite part of the attraction. And it's just, it's just a whole lot of cheesy taunt lines and cheap jump scares from Ghostface that, that don't really land for me. They really don't. Like, I think at one point he slashes the screen and it cracks, but the sound is off. So it was it was really pointless and kind of silly and then it it turns into you being on a subway which i thought was pretty cool but it was a little bit too long and then he was like saying stuff like now you see me now you don't now you see me now you don't and i'm like okay we get it we get it you're scary so then we proceed to act three which was the finale of the whole event and as we're walking into the next room, the walls were just full of like cool art piece spray paintings. And um, it was just so fucking badass, like the, the, the artwork. It's just so like grungy and like dark. And so we get to the room and it is the fucking shrine from the shrine scene in Scream 6. And this room was so fucking cool. It had a giant timer on the the wall that was five minutes so i'm like fuck we only have five minutes to look through all of this so i had to scramble and get as much soaked in as possible i'm talking there were stab film posters there were sketches of the dead cotton weary and dewey r.i.p there were sketches of sydney there were sketches of casey becker roman um, they also had Billy's bloody shirt, Mrs. Loomis's bloody suit, just everything to get the most hardcore fan all giddy inside. From the ice pick Sid stabs Roman with, to Casey Becker's home phone, to the fax machine that blew up in Scream 3, to that thing that Derek was hanging on in Scream 2 at the very end. It was just, it was so, it was so cool. That room was just chef's kiss. It was, it was really cool. Uh, and then once time was up, they had us proceed to the exit, which you had to go down a hallway with mannequins dressed in ghost face costumes that you, you have to go down this hallway to get out. And I already knew something was, was going to go off. <laughs> the video is on my podcast, Instagram, Scream Queer Podcast, and my personal TikTok account, which is Ralph Anthony. That's with three Ys. If you want to check out that video, I kind of document my whole experience there but but overall it was it was a really cool experience and for it being free like they put a lot of money into this and and thought um i just wish it was longer and like a little bit more scary like i wish they had more people dressed up as ghost face like walking around like slashing their knives at you and stuff but i mean you get what you don't pay for right but the whole experience definitely had me feeling so fucking slutty and ready for scream six <laughs> so enough about the experience let's get into the actual film scream six so once again Spoilers will be in the rest of this episode, so if you have no desire to hear spoilers and are planning to watch, then turn back now. Turn back now! Don't do it. Okay. So the film opens with Samara Weaving's character, Laura Crane, at a restaurant bar in New York City. She's having some shots. She's waiting around. She's supposed to meet up with some guy she's been talking with on an app called Flirter or something like that. It's, 
it's kind of like a like a Tinder or like a Bumble or for for the gays, a uh, grinder. It's like a grinder type app. Uh, so the guy starts chatting with her, how he's like lost and asks to call her. They start having a combo, and you know what? I really fucking like this character, okay? First off, Samara's accent is the fucking cutest. She is so cute. And just, like, learning about her makes me really fucking like her. <laughs> she's a professor who teaches at the college. I believe she's, like, a film teacher, and she specializes in, like, slashers or something like that. And she's not too fond of the Stab franchise, which is a first red flag, like being our first victim. But I, I really liked her. Like I, I like I. It made me want to learn more about her and just see more of her in this in this movie. The guy has her go outside to remind him the color of the restaurant. Like why? Then he tells her to meet him on the opposite end of an alley. After acting as if he sees someone approaching him about to attack him, he turns on the infamous voice changer. And we finally get to hear the beautiful voice that is Roger L. Jackson. Can I also just add that Roger L. Jackson, I feel like he really stepped his shit up. Like, his dialogue was fucking awesome. Scream 5 was kind of eh, like with like the like how he talked but i felt like in this one he was back and ready to go for this one so at this point samra's character is midway in the alley and she gets fucking stabbed to death and just hearing her scream made me so sad and and on my first watch i genuinely was really sad like i i think i had my hands in my face like why like why i don't want her to die and my issue with this was there was there was no chase like she was just there standing and then staring. Yeah, just staring into like a dark corner and she didn't do anything. There was no fight. and But yeah, I just wanted to pretty much cry because I really like this character who we got to know within like five minutes. But after the the last slash, it doesn't cut to the title screen. It just, show, it just has the, the killer standing there. The killer actually unmasks himself, which everyone was like, what? what you guys what is going on so it is revealed to be this guy named jason who is played by tony rivalori some of you might know him from spider-man the one with tom holland so he takes his costume off and heads home at this point the audience and myself like i said we're like what the fuck is happening so on his way home he runs into tara carpenter who we all know is played by the little cutie jenna ortega it's uh apparently it's like halloween week or halloween weekend so everyone is walking around in costumes going to parties being loud acting crazy screaming so anyway they exchange a, a combo i guess they know each other cool so now we see jason at his place he puts his costume back in like a little shrine closet thing um he then receives a call from his roommate greg who has the voice of ghost face obviously Apparently, they had planned a killing spree and were targeting Samantha and Tara to finish Richie's film. Richie is Samantha's boyfriend from Scream 5, who was one of the killers, in case you forgot. Turns out, it really isn't his roommate. His roommate is actually dead in the fridge with his head cut off and his body parts everywhere, which I believe is a first for the franchise. I've never seen a beheading. Uh, so Ghostface gives a little who gives a fuck about movies line that was kind of iconic and then we get the beautiful title card that is scream six for me in 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 my opinion it wasn't the best opening okay i think after reading all the positive reviews and hear like seeing everyone just like gush over this game changer opening i i went in with really high expectations thinking it was going to be like this this amazing over the top extraordinary out of this world never the same opening <laughs> but it it was just it was a little different and i i appreciated it but it wasn't like oh my god we cut to our our main characters and i really love the, the core four here samantha carpenter portrayed by melissa barrera is working two crappy jobs and bouncing from therapist to therapist 
her younger sister Tara, played by the very popular Jenna Ortega, Chad and Mindy, played by Mason Gooding and Jasmine Savoy Brown, who in my opinion are the best additions to the Scream franchise. I'm sorry. I'm not just saying that because I think Mason Gooding is beautiful, but I just like, I love their lightness and comedy that they bring to these films. Like, Mindy is a fucking comedy legend. So, okay, so sorry, I'm just like, I'm gushing over my, over my, over these characters. Okay, so, so those three are in New York for college, okay? Um, anyway, I really love how like fleshed out and detailed these, these characters were because I really grew attached to them during this film, which for me, that made the stakes seem high. Like, fuck, if we lose one of these, it's going to fucking hurt. Sam and Tara's dynamic was solid. Okay. It was, it was pretty solid. Tara felt suffocated by Sam being overprotective of her and Sam wanted Tara to go to therapy instead of parting hard. It felt real. And I felt, I felt bad for Sam because she, like her name was being tarnished. Like she was being accused of being the mastermind of the murders from the last film so by the way melissa's acting is so much better in this movie it is so much more improved the last one it just it just wasn't doing it for me i know i feel bad because i know she was getting a lot of hate for the last film but it just it was it was very lackluster for me and and i had a hard time buying her character's emotions because of how she delivered them this movie hands down she redeemed herself for me the new additions were not just generic new entries just for a higher body count the standout for me was mindy's love interest anika played by devin nakoda she was likable her energy mixed with mindy's made me wish i could have more of her and them together but anika sadly dies during that ladder scene the whole ladder sequence had me on the edge of my fucking seat it was intense the next newbie quinn was another standout she was she was pretty funny too she was the sex positive roommate of sam tara and mindy she brought like i said comedy but what i loved about her is just how familiar she felt i feel like we all have like we all know a quinn we all have a quinn in, in our friend group like we all have that that one girl. Leona Liberato did an awesome job. So her death was nothing special. Her death. Cute neighbor Danny was a perfect choice for Sam's love interest. He was he was edgy. He had that like tough guy persona going for him. And I honestly wanted to bite. Like he was sexy. Josh Segarra did that. Hey. Uh I'm excited to see his character in Scream 7 if we get one. They kind of try to make him a, a red herring, but I didn't really buy it because he seemed genuine. Like he was like, I don't know. He's just like one of those guys who just like is like so like tough and like, like, like a no bullshit type of type of guy. So yeah, I, I, I didn't, I didn't really buy him as a, as a red herring. Like I trusted him anyway. So Chad's roommate, Ethan and detective Bailey were probably the weakest for me. I, I didn't really care for them. Jack Chapman didn't sell the whole shy boy Ethan was supposed to be. Dermot Mulroney's acting was not doing it for me. For Detective Bailey, his lines kind of made it cheesy for me. So it's a pass for those two. Let's get to legacy characters. Gail and Kirby. I was soaking wet when Kirby Hayden Pentiere came on. As an FBI agent, she was serving. She was giving. She was mother. Okay? Aside from me wanting her to have a bigger role, it was kind of everything I, I had wanted, honestly. They didn't sideline her like I felt they did with Sydney in the last movie. She was there and her presence was felt. She, and she kicked ass and looked great doing it. Her scene with Mindy was pure horror film geek candy. My bussy was throbbing. Gail, she was... On, <laughs> Gail wasn't really needed. Like I felt like her being in this film, it, it's. I mean, I love Courtney Cox, and she does this this character well. At this point, the punch scene was a little nostalgic, 
wink to diehard fans. The chase scene, was it Scream 2 level 10? No, I'm sorry. I know some of you thought it was epic. I just thought it was intense. The phone call had some of the killer's meanest lines ever. Low blows were thrown. It was cool to finally see Gail talk to a killer because she never really got a call before. Okay, this was this was so badass when, when the killer grabs Gail's boyfriend behind her back like a fucking ninja. That shit was so, like, I was like, oh, fuck. This fucking ghost face is not fucking around. And then to throw his ass through her shelves, so fucking cool. Uh, but as for the actual chase scene, Gail just ran in, ran in a fucking circle. She fought with the killer for a bit and predictably was stabbed in the shoulder, the leg, and it, and I think in the on the side of her stomach. Like she kind of got it handed to her. I I honestly I honestly felt like it was worse than Dewey in Five. What do we think? No? Yes? Maybe so? But maybe she has bionic organs too because she got she got stabbed and. Which is what a lot of characters seem to be packing in this film, you know? Like, but I'll also get into that later. <laughs> so the film handled Sydney's absence, I, in my opinion, fine. It would have not made sense to have really have her. It would have honestly felt kind of forced because she has no business in New York City. <laughs> like, oh my God, the ghost face killer is back. Let's go ahead and call Sydney because she's going to, she handles everything. Like, no, it, it would have been dumb, actually. Uh, maybe a FaceTime call to Gail, but I mean, we all know Nev Campbell said, fuck y'all, pay me what I want, fine. The shrine scene was cool. I thought the film would show more of the Easter eggs, maybe close-ups of outfits, but it leaves it for you to scope out quickly on the on, on the one scene that like shows the, the whole the whole shrine. Uh, Skeet Ulrich is back as Billy. Sam has a few moments where she hallucinates him and... Those moments weren't really needed for me. Chad and Tara's little love story was kind of cheese ball too. But you know what? I I I love this kind of cheese. Like I love chick flick cheese. So I I got the energy from this little romance. I was sitting on my seat all like like all giddy and like smirking. I mean, it's a it's a movie, right? Like it has to take you on this on this journey and this and this ride of all different kinds of emotions and and feelings um but uh then ghost fate stabs tara in the fucking back and chad oh my god chad was so hot he beat the fuck out of ghost face he gave me everything i wanted he is the star he is the other moment okay then the part that really got me soaking wet was when another ghost face comes in and they like they're holding Chad down and they're like stabbing the shit out of him. And then they turn around and they do that like whole like knife cleaning thing that ghost face does. And they're like all in sync with it. And they look like fucking soldiers. It looks it's so badass. It is so fucking cool. And I'm so geeking out right now. But it, like when they turn on, they go sing like that noise that like knife sharpening. Oh, it was just it was so awesome. I was wet there. Um, but yeah, this and this movie definitely stepped up the action aspect. It was it was so good. It was so fucking good. The killer felt different. Although they did fall a few times and get beat up a bit, I didn't get that clumsy goofball ghost face that we're all used to. Uh, this one felt nasty. Does that like? Do you guys get what I'm saying? Like they felt almost almost like they they didn't give a shit. It's New York, so anywhere can be a hiding spot, and that's exactly what they gave us. Ghostface popped out of alleys, out from between trash bins, and that fucker chased Sam and Tara in the street, outside. The bodega scene was badass. I need Ghostface to have a shotgun going forward, okay? Like, he needs a shotgun. A shotgun and the knife. That's it. I I really loved like New York as a set piece for this movie. Uh it really was Ghostface's playground. Like it it really was and it it makes the character way more frightening. And can we just all appreciate that this film was uh filmed in Canada 
and it was still able to make it feel like like new york like it was so it was beautiful it was actually really pretty um the film wasn't scary it wasn't as as dark as the trailer made it out to be um however the scariest scene was was mindy in the subway i was fucking creeped out i almost passed out from all the flashing lights but that scene was actually pretty scary it it pissed me off because it shows how people don't really give a shit about anything but like what's going on like in their on their phone or like like i don't know it just just people don't pay attention uh so mindy gets stabbed again and next to a sleeping girl and that like really pisses me off because <laughs> she's like just there like fucking stabbed and this girl's like asleep like bitch how could you not hear uh and how many lives do these people have though like i'm talking shit because i want everyone to live but they get stabbed so many times like so many times uh which leads me into the ending okay let me just say don't don't come for me don't 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 come with your pitchforks and your and your axes but this was the weakest part of the film for me the film starts and it doesn't really let you have that long of a break in between like deaths and the the scares so okay so they meet back at the shrine and Sam, Tara, Chad, and Kirby. Remember, Mindy was uh, stabbed on the subway and taken to the hospital where her and Gail are safe for the rest of the movie. Um, the fight with Chad and the two ghost faces was great. The action b- between Sarah and uh, Sam was great. When Sam kills, she's a fucking hunter. She is a fucking badass. I need to see her as the fucking killer in, in Scream 7 because she is brutal. She just like fucking goes at it like all fast um okay so back to the weak part it was the reveal for me everyone the reveal it just it it turns out detective bailey who he was the mastermind this whole time uh remember how i mentioned the ending was kind of spoiled for me well that was who i had seen so i kind of already knew that it it was him when i started the movie (laughs) uh but what was a surprise was not really shy boy ethan's i kind of knew it was it was him before he unmasked but and he was also detective bailey's son uh he was going uh he was under an alias to kind of to hide it uh but it was the third killer quinn miss i faked my death that made me gasp i was like what so this detective and his two bratty kids go on a good old-fashioned revenge rampage because Samantha killed their son and sibling, Richie, from Scream 5, who was portrayed by Jack Quaid. I mean, it was an improvement, the whole motive from from 5. I didn't really like five motives, like 5's motive either. Uh, but maybe I was hopeful for like the whole cult plot or hey i know i know it's tired i know it's kind of dumb but maybe just 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 maybe there's like a little 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 tiny hope that that it was due (laughs) and i kind of hated how they tried to make kirby a red herring too like i was just like really like i didn't believe that for one second like stop bye so yeah that was the probably the weakest part for me uh but the action was pretty fucking cool the let me go scene where tara is hanging from the second story of the theater and then sam hands her the the knife and then she lands on ethan and then she gets stabbed too as she lands on him like bionic organs but she stabs him in the mouth which was pretty fucking brutal and she tells him that he is gonna die a virgin (laughs) and then quinn gets her teeth knocked out by a brick and then she gets shot in the head and then Sam puts on the Billy, the Billy Ghostface costume and stabs the fuck out of Detective Bailey. Like, she goes off. She is a maniac. Um, the final scare scene, the final scare scene, okay. Uh, it was, it was eh. Uh, Kirby throws Stu Mocker's TV on Ethan, which was a cute little nod. But Baby Girl was shot and stabbed, so how'd she do that? Um, but, you know what, overall, Scream 6, it, it it was epic i give it that 
But even as obsessed and how much of a fanatic I am for this franchise, I'm also a realist. And at the end of the day, I'm not going to rate this movie a perfect score because, like I said, it's my favorite franchise, but nothing is perfect, okay? Nothing. And I had originally rated it an 8 out of 10, but after my second watch, I only bumped it a little, so it's an 8.5 out of 10. So the cons. Superhuman characters. How are these people getting stabbed so many times and living jumping around running like are they are they superheroes at at this point should this be a fucking marvel movie uh some of the acting i wasn't sold on there was a lot of like head stabs to where i was like okay let's move on let's let's think of a different way to kill someone uh from samantha's therapist getting stabbed in in the like nose area detective bailey in the eye and um, yeah and also the finale motive like i said and the lack of it feeling like they are in the middle of halloween season i didn't really get that whole halloween vibe aside from just seeing people dressed up they didn't really sell me on like it's halloween season this is why people are dressed up like this also all the easter eggs from all the all the horror movies like i saw pinhead there was werewolves there was the little asian ghost girls um the babadook michael myers freddy jason all that it was fucking great uh samurai weaving's character from ready or not like it was it was awesome uh that's a pro so the rest of my pros are chad mindy and kirby amazing samantha and tara's sister dynamic the fucking action the set piece is absolutely beautiful the way ghostface can blend into the darkness of new york and be literally anywhere the suspense was great roger l jackson's portrayal as ghostface's voice this time was chef's kiss it was better uh the rest of the kills were great uh the bodega subway and double ghostface scenes were the best for me overall everyone this movie was amazing not perfect but definitely up there in my rankings uh if you love this film or or didn't let me know some of you have already been letting me know and i've asked some of you as well but if you want to share your input please don't be shy message me on instagram at scream queer podcast or even my personal account which is at ralph anthony that's with three y's But there you have it, everyone. The Scream 6 craze has come, has gone. Let's hope we get a Scream 7. But with that said, I love you all for listening. I will talk to you all on the next episode. Bye!